tonight's topic is Australia's shame, violence against women, causes or solutions you thinking needed. And our speakers are Eva Cox, who I'm sure is well known to all of you, a sociologist and activist, and Roxanne McMurray, who is the CEO of the Leichhardt Women's Health Community Centre. Because I've been around for a long time, I'm very much aware of what changes and what doesn't change. And one of the things that's been interesting me recently is trying to work out what we did manage to achieve in the 70s and what things are actually still needing to be achieved and what things have changed and what things haven't changed. Now, I'm not an expert on domestic violence. I'll make that quite clear. If there's people in the audience who work in that area, and I know Roxanne works around those areas too, that you probably have a much greater knowledge of the details of what goes on in those areas than I have. But I am a researcher and a policy wonk, as they sort of tend to refer to us as, insofar as one of the things I've been doing for years is trying to get people to change the policies I think don't work and trying to work out how you actually work out what does work. And one of the things that really interests me about domestic violence at the moment is we've got a lot of noise being made about the fact that this is a crisis, that people are dying, we have to do this, we've got accounting of the number of dead women, and a whole lot of public discussion about isn't it awful? But when you actually sit down and take a good long look at what's happening, I must say that 40 odd years afterwards, after the fact that we started to put domestic violence on the public agenda, we really haven't made much progress in terms of changing the incidence of domestic violence. Now, the women's movement has done an excellent job in setting up refuges and setting up crisis centres, setting up referral services, providing a range of services. But if you sit down and take a really hard line view on that, I mean, we've done the absolutely classic feminine bit of rescuing people afterwards. But we haven't actually managed to do much about the social change bit, which is changing the factors in society that create violence. And I think it's time we actually stopped and looked at it. And Pache, I don't know whether there are people here who are involved in the things. I think feminism has something to look at itself quite severely about because there's been some resistance in the area to opening it up and taking a much longer look at what are the causes of domestic violence? What are the issues that create the violence? Because we focused on dealing with the victims of violence. And even the way it was advertised today, violence against women. It's always talking about the victims. Now, one of the things I think I've learnt from a long history in sort of as a social change agent is talking about victims does not actually create change. It's a mistake that a lot of people, and particularly some of the people on the left, have made for a very long time. That if you do what I used to refer to as competing victim game playing, that as somehow or other you manage, particularly in a neoliberal funding system, to be able to convince people that you have a greater need than other people. But it doesn't actually address the issues of why people get into that situation. And sometimes it becomes counterproductive. So we've got a lot of stuff focusing at the moment on the legal system and the police and the healthcare and the various other social security and even now sort of workplaces to try and fix up what happens to the individuals who are beaten up and suffer domestic violence. But we haven't really taken a sufficiently good look at why violence continues and why it really hasn't shifted when you look at the statistics. I mean, the statistics are a bit shonky. I went through and dragged out a whole lot of things there. But when you start looking at it, you know, I mean, I've found things like attitudes to domestic and family and sexual violence can strongly influence reporting behaviour. Misconceptions and assumptions on masculinity, sexuality, violence and sexual assault can present barriers for both men and women in terms of gaining recognition and understanding and disclosing information and accessing the justice system. So there's still a sense in which we're not really clear about are people talking about it. There's still a sort of deathly silence very often about it, apart from, as I say, the public fuss about victims. 
there's a lot of fuss sometimes about why do women stay in the relationships, but not really the focus, and this is what I'd like people to think about, and we've got quite a, a sort of reasonably gender balanced or even slightly maybe more males in the audience tonight, is that I think it's a time that we actually started looking at what the issues are around masculinity and the construction of violence in our society that actually creates the situation. We are still doing, in fact, more so now than ever, and I suspect it is the influence of neoliberalism to some degree, focusing on the victims, on the individuals, on the perpetrator, and punishing the perpetrator, and helping the victim. But we spend no real time looking at why this stuff is still so prevalent. What is it that creates men's idea that they have the right to control the behaviour of the women that they're living with, which is very often the cause of this. Why they do the very, you know, what, what are the sort of background reasons that go with masculinity that actually create that? And there's, there's quite a few quotes which I'm not going to try and read out now, but it sort of keeps coming up. That uh, violence is much more frequent in men who have the idea that men ought to be in control, that there's a sense of their right to control, right to violence, there's a note here in one of the reports I went through that said people accept the idea of equality at the workplace but they really don't still, there's much lesser acceptance of the idea that you need equality in the household. So we've actually got a lot of attitudes that come out of the constructions of masculinity and a lot of men who feel very threatened by women. I can tell you that from, you know, from my Twitter feed. There's a real nasty hostility around from a lot of men who feel that women have taken control, that they're, you know, that they're ripping men off, particularly people who've been through the law, family law business. There's a level of hostility which we don't talk about. There's very few studies of men and male violence. When you start going through the research, and because I'm a researcher I've done that, there's practically nothing that goes, that's actually been done on it. When you take a look at the various things there, in May 2008, the Rudd government established a national council to reduce violence against women and children and advise on measures to reduce the incidence. That's seven years ago now. The council concluded there's considerable scope for greater cooperation, collaboration, blah, 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 and the Commonwealth and states. <laughs> They're still banging on interminably about that. But this, and the, the challenges that it identified seven years ago is the system is fragmented, yeah. Gaps between policy intent and implementation is. And I've capitalised this one. Failure to invest in primary prevention. So seven years ago they're pointing out we don't have any primary prevention type stuff. And the other one that came up very clearly is lack of evidence of what works in prevention services and legal responses and so on. There's not a lot of evidence around about even in the services we've got what works and what doesn't work. And I mean, I think that's one of the problems that Roxanne will talk about, which is the problems of the women's refuge stuff. When I went back to look at the evidence of what models worked, everybody could tell you stories, but very few people actually had statistics and things to say, this is why it works and this is how it works. So there's a real dearth of any sort of serious understanding on those sorts of things. And if you look at it, nothing much has changed. I mean, I found a quote actually which came out in the last couple of days, which is ANRO, which makes a lot of fuss about the fact that it's going to change the agenda, is now talking to people about the way that they are going to address the issue of looking at changing public attitudes and perpetrators things. They're not doing it yet. Why 40 years afterwards are we not looking at what is causing this? Is it because we're too scared to talk about men? Or is it too scared to, you know, that, it's, uh, that the issue of masculinity comes up? A lot of it's been a very firm conviction by some of the more hardline feminist groups that we shouldn't spend many money on men, that the money should go into the services for women, which is all very well, but if we don't actually stop it, we're not going to actually get anywhere with the fact that the women are still going to be the victims of violence. So I think we actually need to start talking about uh, about who do because there's evidence from the surveys that a lot of people think slapping people around is not too bad. And if you keep emphasising dead people, you're not going to get the reaction from somebody who goes around saying, but I never hit her. I just control her money, who she mixes with, when she goes out, keep hold of the car keys, you know, stop her having any uh, going shopping, tell her she's not allowed to visit her friends, but I don't hit her, so I'm not a 
a perpetrator of domestic violence. We don't talk about that. We do the scare tactics. We do the end type stuff. And we don't really talk about the control freaks who are part of the problem, who often do end up murdering somebody, but that's not the point. The point is that long before they get to that, they're making some women and children's life miseries. So I briefly want to finish off with a, cheerful, a more cheerful bit. I was a, part of my crossness about this is I was involved last year and three years ago in the evaluation of a program called Tackling Violence. How many here have heard, people here have heard about this program? Not very many. This is a very successful New South Wales state government program that started at Mudjingal, which is an Aboriginal women's centre, where they were funded by the state government to go out and run uh, workshops uh, in football clubs, country rugby league clubs, where they actually sign up the clubs and the clubs suspend any player after they've been to, they sign a pledge that they're not allowed to do violence to anybody in the family or they get suspended from playing. It's been going now for, I think, about six years and we evaluated it, as say, four years ago and again a year ago. It's actually very cheap. It costs about $30,000 per club involved and that includes the ads and it includes the workshops and it includes all the admin expenses and various other things. And what it does is it creates an atmosphere in those town in the towns in which it happens, and these are rural places, and it's not just indigenous people, we think, where people are prepared to talk about domestic violence. And when we went back the last time, we asked the people we interviewed, had they in the past 12 months stopped somebody to create doing a violent act? And 50% of them said yes. Now, some of those mightn't have been very violent, but it was still something, because in the past, people tended to look at the ceiling, look at the floor, <clears throat> or ignore it, but the fact that they're prepared to say to somebody, stop it, is a big move forward. They talk about it with their mates, they talk about it with their girlfriends and their partners and the families and the kids. It's changing the culture. I just brought in, I was talking to the person, Art Sue Lindsay is the person that runs this program for the state government, whether she could come tonight, but she was actually out west. But she's just come back from Walcott. Now, most of you have probably seen some stuff about Walgett on the telly. There's been a whole lot of things about the violence and that. They were down at the footy club and even at the school, which is in so much trouble, running meetings with a whole lot of people, including the blokes around there, on domestic violence, which were being very productive, helpful, interested, committed, change-oriented at the same time as the school was exploding in various other areas. There's a legitimacy about running something through the football club, which is different to running it through the domestic violence services, different to running it through you know, the legal aid, different to running it through the healthcare, different to even running it through the Aboriginal services in the area. And when we asked people what really mattered to them, they said it's being told to stop it by their mates. So we know peer groups work. I'm telling you about this for two reasons. One is, I think, if we can keep tackling violence going, it will gradually create a cultural difference in the towns it's in. Because some of the towns have stopped other people stopped other people playing, not because they bashed their family, but because they bashed other people. They're just saying, we're no longer prepared to have you bashing people up. So you do get culture change. It's slow. But they've got 25% cut, more than 25% cut in their money this year, because they didn't get any money from the Commonwealth. They were getting 200000 from the Commonwealth. So they're doing less, they can't run the ads that they were running and the, people like the ads because they had pictures of the local footy people and if you had any hint that you'd hit anybody you were not allowed to be part of the things. They even reshot one of the ads because they had somebody in it last year. So it's a very powerful peer group process, yet nobody knows about it. It's not funded. It's just, as I say, it's been cut in funding. You know, we worked out that if you save one and a half, I did a cost-benefit study, so somebody wanted it and did some magic with figures, and came up with the fact that if they stopped one and a half notified domestic violence incidents per club, they'd more than paid for the amount of money. And yet it's not there, it's not being pushed. Groups like ANRO and so on ignore Sue when she tries to ring them up. You know, there's a real sort of closed circle within some of these groups which means that they're not really broadening out and taking a good long look at what works and what doesn't work. And quite frankly, I think it's time that we started to change the debate because I've talked to quite a lot of people now. And there's almost a sigh of relief 
that we don't have to keep focusing on dead women, that we, there's actually something we can do about it. So one of the reasons I wanted to talk tonight was to say it's time that we started looking at it, that men started looking at, at what happens to them in terms of masculinity, that women started saying, let's have a look at what it is about the interactions that, can, you know, that, that reflect entrenched attitudes. To look at it, because one of the things that comes through here is that this is a social problem. It comes out of cultural beliefs. It is not an individual problem, and I'm sorry, the crime and punishment system only works in individuals. Its capacity to discourage people from doing things in areas like this is probably minimal. So this is why I think we really do need to do some rethinking and reworking. For example, we'll now tell you about the more, probably more positive things, but also the problems that you even get funding, the services afterwards. And that's part of the problem, because people are really anxious about not losing funding for services that are needed. But at the same time, we also need to sort of work out how we fund these other things which are desperately needed to stop the process. Thank you.